Thank you very much, David. So uh, good news for you. I am the last uh, speaker uh, of the conference. Uh, bad news for me, Doug Irwin did a presentation yesterday morning that covered the politics of trade in, uh, in great detail. Uh, good news for all of us, it was extraordinary. Uh, he did a fantastic job, and I'll simply try to build on that. He did, I don't want to say he cheated, but he used a very old academic trick of using Muppets in his presentation. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I was going to just take his whole presentation and, you know, try to do justice to it. I'll maybe steal one or two slides, but obviously use it as a jumping off point. Um, I'll provide or try to provide, you know, the viewpoint as a, a former member of Congress, former senator to some of these trade issues that uh, Congress has had to deal with in the past, will deal with in the future. And uh, I mean, the issues that uh, Professor Hillman just laid out are extraordinary, but at the same time, they ultimately you know, have to be voted on, right? By Democrats, Republicans, partisans in Congress, 435 members. I used to say it was like a, you know, this colossal kindergarten class, you know, trying to organize and, and work with different coalitions. It's a huge challenge. Uh, but I do think there have been some, some key transition points in the politics of trade um, that I want to highlight. I'll talk about the recent legislation that's uh, been passed and likely to pass in Congress. And, and really, in short, I'll uh, tell a few stories and express a few opinions. And ultimately, that's really the best productive use of a former uh, politician, right? So. <laughs> So in the Senate, the majority party provides the presiding officer every day, the person sitting in the chair. Uh, and typically, that responsibility falls on to the new members, the freshman senators, because the members who have been there for 10 or 15 years, they don't want to spend two hours sitting in the chair with the gavel you know, calling on people. So uh, one day, I'm uh, sitting in the chair. And down to the floor comes Senator Fritz Hollings, late great senator from South Carolina. And Fritz steps to the podium uh, and, well, at his desk, we all had mics at our desk, and he starts to speak about the budget deficit. Mr. President George Bush, $400 billion deficit. He doesn't want to talk about the economy. His advisor, Mr. Karl Rove, doesn't want to talk about the deficit. All he wants to talk about is free trade, free trade. The $400 billion deficit they heard in the economy. And then he turns to me. Well, the presiding officer, the, the senator from New Hampshire, he knows what I'm talking about. He's been on the budget committee. He understands these things. So there were two outcomes to this sort of tense moment for me, because this is three months into my term, I think. One, I'm thinking, if my family is watching this at home, you know, they're thinking, why doesn't John answer him? Why doesn't he say something? Why doesn't he respond? But if you're the presiding officer, you just preside. You, know, you don't debate, you just preside. But the, the second thing that his, his admonition, a, a, a cry of free trade, free trade, uh, brought to, uh, to my mind uh, was ultimately this senator. Henry Clay. Henry Clay was the, uh, the greatest proponent, not the inventor, but the greatest proponent of the American system. Came to Congress, I think, in 1816. Probably, that's close enough, probably wrong, but close enough. And the American system consisted of three pillars, Bank of the United States, investment in infrastructure, which at the time meant mostly canals and, and, uh, and bridges and, and turnpikes, and the tariff, the tariff. And this quote is from his arguably most important speech on the American system given in 1832. And he called free trade, free trade. The call for free trade is unavailing as the cry of a spoiled child in its nurse's arms for the moon or the stars that glitter in the firmament of the heaven. Who talks like this? <laughs> no senator I ever met. But it has never existed and it never will exist. So uh, Clay was 
you know, one of the great proponents of the tariff. Professor Irwin showed this chart yesterday. And, and to me, I'm an engineer by training, so I, I love a, a good chart. But you can see starting at you know, 1820, right around the time that, that Clay came uh, uh, to Congress, uh, the House first and then the Senate, the tariff was the dominant topic, economic talk, topic in the Senate. And it really you know, defined the makeup. Right? It was northern. It was driven. It was urban. Uh, it was manufacturing focused, and it was Whigs. Clay was a Whig. Uh, I, I visited a, a club in, in London that still celebrates Whiggery. You know, it's, it's the center of Whiggery in England, and I'm not even sure what that means, but there's obviously a connection between the parties. But the, the Whigs supported the tariff, obviously. Those who opposed the tariff, who supported free trade, they were rural, they were Democrat, they were Southern and they were agrarian. And these debates dominated Congress. D this was the central uh, debate in trade, not for a decade, not for two decades, but for 130 years. I mean, quite literally until uh, 1946, uh, with the end of the, uh, the Second World War. I mean, they obviously made arguments about protecting key American industries, not unlike the same kinds of arguments uh, that were made in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even as we lowered tariffs, and then with the more current debates that we'll discuss. But for 140 years, and, and you can see, one of the things that fascinates me about this chart is, uh, you see the tariff of abominations is 1828. This led South Carolina to forward the proposition of nullification that if a law was passed that they thought was unconstitutional, they could nullify it. And that tension, controversy, resulted in a compromise to lower tariffs gradually over time. And you can see that, you know, from 1830 to, to 1850, 1855. That was uh, the, the great compromise that was reached in the Senate. And then if you think that the, the alignments didn't hold, I love this divot here. Underwood, 1913. Democrats managed to wrest control of Congress in 1912 with the election of Woodrow Wilson. And what did they do? They lowered tariffs. So the same alignments that existed in 1830, 1840, 1850 still existed in 1912. <clears throat> so it, the world followed. I mean, if, if you look at what I England and France were doing, certainly in the earlier part of the, the 19th century, the later part, obviously, Smoot-Hawley is the sort of the aberration uh, in, in the center of that chart. Um, and then we get to the gap period, 1946. What's not to like? If you're, sit you're a member of Congress, you're sitting in the House, you're sitting in the Senate, the United States has essentially uh, provided the arms, the equipment, the manufacturing, the know-how to achieve victory in the Second World War. We're dominant from a manufacturing standpoint. The standpoint there is no number two in 1946. We have agriculture, we have manufacturing, we have technology. Why wouldn't you support an effort to export these things around the world? Why wouldn't you support an effort to lower trade barriers, to cut tariffs, to improve access for American goods around the world? So that's the bipartisan consensus that starts in 1946, that uh, supports uh, the GATT process. Um, the uh, trade agreements at that time found general you know, a bipartisanship. If you, if you uh, were from a manufacturing uh, part of the country. You wanted goods to be exported around the world. If you were from an uh, agricultural area, you wanted your goods to be exported around the world. There was little or no competition. <clears throat> In 1979, I think we, we had an important transition point. I, I, I would say the end of the gap period, you know, uh, uh, Professor Hillman talked about the, the death of WTO or, or maybe uh, 
trying to revive WTO. But for me, the end of the, the GATT process was 1986, the, the beginning of the Uruguay round, um, which ended with the uh, agreement and the creation of WTO. But we entered a different era in the early 80s, and I would call it the age of the free trade agreement. And it was really Ronald Reagan in his campaign in 1979 that laid out the idea of a free trade agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And I, I really feel that that leadership, coming from where it did, you know, helped breathe uh, new life into the idea of these multilateral trade agreements, life that you know, might not have been there um, had we not had that kind of leadership, making broad macroeconomic arguments, one, for Im Im improving uh, growth, for getting access to less expensive goods from around the world, but there was also obviously a, a security element to it, building economic ties, um, building security ties with countries around the world to help provide a bulwark against uh, Soviet aggression. So FTAs, you know, there was Caribbean Basin Initiative, NAFTA. Uh, during my time in the, the Senate, we passed the uh, African Growth and Opportunity Act. There were free trade agreements with Colombia and Korea and, and Panama. You know, all of these focused primarily on tariffs and access. But certainly with NAF NAFTA, and extending through uh, a number of the other agreements, um, came the, the side agreement, right? Uh, NAFTA most prominently, side agreements on labor and the environment. Uh, we can discuss the politics, whether they were effective or ineffective, whether they had good enforcement mechanisms or not, whether they were just window dressing. But it was still the first time you had what we might call domestic policy issues, domestic policy goals attached to a, a broader uh, piece of, of trade legislation. Um, so labor, environment, human rights. Um, the turning point comes with TPP. It's negotiated and championed by a Democratic president. Yet it was opposed by pres uh, presidential candidates of both parties. You know, previously, with the, uh, the various free trade agreements, uh, NAFTA passed with bipartisan support. It was signed by a Democratic president. Uh, these others received broad bipartisan support some pockets of opposition for specific mercantilist interest, textiles uh, would be a good, good example with the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. With the TPP, I, I think we saw a dramatic change in the politics. This was an opportunity, in effect, to restore and strengthen the bipartisan commitment to trade deals, because it was negotiated by a Democratic president. Whether for lack of communication at the time, lack of commitment by the president, lack of champions in the House or the Senate, it was left to linger and really left to the devices of the, the presidential election. Donald Trump came out against it. I guess we shouldn't be too surprised. Hillary Clinton came out against it. Bernie Sanders came out against it. And when you have that kind of opposition, during a presidential campaign, you're going to find very few members, House members or senators, who are running for re-election that are going to stand in opposition to their party's nominee. <laughs> the TPP is not dead. TPP is sleeping. Um, but the challenges of, re of reviving it are going to be enormous, enormous. Uh, 
Trump really used the failure of the TPP as a springboard to begin the process of renegotiating NAFTA. And by that time, given the sentiment of in both parties in the House and in the Senate, there was really nothing legislatively, nothing politically that stood in President Trump's way. The, you know, we recall the, the discussion the, in the, let's say, in the press, in the media, academics, many people in this room probably you know, uh, wrote and opined very thoughtfully about the risks and the issues associated with any attempt to scrap and renegotiate NAFTA. The, the, the relative successes, success of the renegotiation has been discussed, uh, very, very modest changes, uh, hailed as the greatest agreement of all time by, by the president. But it was that failure of TPP that dramatically changed sentiment for trade in the United States Congress. So where are we today? Uh, the bipartisanship of GATT is certainly gone. A presidential leadership that uh, is focused on driving bilateral or regional trade agreements uh, like the FTAs, that's gone. On the Republican side, the Republicans who were excited and anxious to carry the mantle of the benefits of free trade from an economic perspective uh, are largely gone. I mean, when I came to the Senate, when I came to, the, uh, to Congress, we had members like uh, Jim Colby, David Dreyer, um, Lee Hamilton, who were very internationally focused, very supportive of the idea of a multilateral agreement to lower tariffs, to improve access. And those types of representatives are, are largely gone. The Trump tariffs have become the Biden tariffs. So again, if you go to the House or the Senate today, try to find a, a member that publicly and strongly opposes the current tariff regime on China. It'd be very hard to do. And we've entered a new age of unilateralism. You can call it uh, um, industrial policy. You can call it unilateralism. Uh, you can call it just straight subsidies. But Congress has begun to pass legislation where th that effect certainly affects trade, but where trade really is not the goal or the objective of the legislation. This is domestic policy legislation where trade is now used as a tool, as a vehicle, as a hammer to further the domestic needs. And, and that's essentially what I'm trying to get at with the tail wagging the dog. The idea of a piece of trade legislation in and of itself, it's not a thing of the past, but it is not central to the priority list of any member of Congress right now. And we can start by looking at the CHIPS Act. And there's a lot more to it than, than just a, a, a few bullet points on a slide. But the key parts for uh, fabrication, $30 billion in subsidy uh, for uh, SME, uh, uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment uh, facilities. There's $12 billion in NAST grants for advanced manufacturing centers, whatever that might be. Uh, NIS, NIST has never given out grants like this, and we have no advanced manufacturing centers, so this will be an adventure. Uh, $24 billion in investment tax credits. Those who voted for this piece of legislation did not look at it as a piece of trade legislation. Now, they may have thought that this is important to national security. Uh, this is an important counter to China, perhaps, although the bulk of the most sophisticated chips in the world don't come from China. They, they come from other places. But what precedent does this set? Right? Other countries, not just China, 
How does Japan react to this? How does Korea react to this? How does Germany react to this? How do the Netherlands react to this? These are the countries that have strong, competitive semiconductor manufacturing industries that export to the United States, export around the world. Is this a chips bill, or is this the beginning of a, a chips trade war? I don't know, but, but we have to think about it in those terms. In October, sanctions against China. These, I mean, the strongest technology sanctions, I think, that we've ever uh, um, placed on China. On the equipment itself, on memory and logic chips, first time I think ever we've placed a restriction on memory chips. I mean, they're, they're actually commodities. A restriction on supply chain, a restriction on people. If you have a green card, if you're a US citizen, you can no longer work and support a company that's providing any of these things to China. The stated goal, freeze China in place. <clears throat> you know, there's something to be said for setting the bar low, right? Keep expectations low and then exceed them. This is going to be an incredibly tough one to achieve. And this, again, this is uh, the goal of the legislation. This is the goal of the National Security Council, the goal of the administration. Is this a piece of national, is this a national security uh, move or is this the beginning of a new trade war? Inflation Reju Reduction Act, EV tax credits, price. Are we gonna allow EV tax credits on $55,000 vehicles, $80,000 SUVs, final assembly. Content rules for the percentage of the vehicle or in this case the vehicle has to be final assembled in the United States, battery content. 50% of the battery content has to be sourced in the United States. Uh, they make an allowance for uh, countries in the uh, free trade agreement with the United States. Uh, but these are very, very specific to trading partners, content, where it's assembled. Is this, a, a, well, it's not an Inflation Reduction Act, I think we, we know that, but is, is this a piece of uh, domestic policy legislation, that's how those that voted for it view it. They viewed it as infrastructure, uh, in environmental support, electric vehicle support, but if you're in Germany or France or Korea or Japan, you view this as, a, as an inappropriate, discriminatory subsidy against businesses and industries and manufacturers in your country. This is the beginning of a trade war. And, and I can say that with some confidence because what has the response been? The border adjustable carbon tax that Professor Hillman talked about. Um, I don't think it's going to be implemented in October. I think, I think it'll probably be delayed because the legislation required to achieve this is going to be so complex. One, it's gonna be nearly impossible to do, but two, it will inspire response, a trade response from the United States Congress. What makes it, what makes it so difficult to do? It was alluded to, but let me just give you one example. A ton of aluminum manufactured in Washington State using 100% Hydroelectric electricity would be taxed the same way a ton of steel manufactured in Korea using coal-fired electricity. Now, the Europeans may say, well, we're gonna make adjustments for that. But as was alluded to, a mechanism that calculates the precise amount of carbon that did or didn't go into every item in every container ship on every vessel that we watched in that original graphic around the ta taking material around the world, I I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say, not gonna happen. So, where does that leave us? Is there a path forward uh, on trade to get us back on track to multilateral agreements that are designed to improve access, reduce trade friction, lower tariffs, 
perhaps deal with some of these ancillary issues, but that are, are focused on improving and strengthening those ties rather than making statements about what other countries' domestic policy should look like? Well, one, we need time. Right? The politics right now is not going to facilitate those kinds of debates. We, we just talked about the, the friction with China. And this is true, important uh, a series of national security concerns and issues with China. The tension created by the, with the EU as a result of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and, and their counterproposal for a, a carbon uh, border adjustable tax. Um, the fact that the Trump tariffs have become the Biden tariffs. This is just not a climate conducive to building political support, electoral support for free trade. So we need some time to, to sort of reduce the temperature in the room. We need leadership. Leadership matters. I started talking about Clay, but you know, Henry, uh, 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 Truman in the, um, in the GATT era, you know, being willing to step forward and provide US leadership for that process. Ronald Reagan, NAFTA, Clinton, uh, signing NAFTA and, and being committed to continuing the process of developing free trade agreements. Good leadership matters, and bad leadership matters too. Uh, 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 the effect that the, the President Trump has had, and, and now President Biden has had on this climate. So we need better leadership. I, I hesitate to think about it or to say it, um, but you know the answer to restoring America's commitment to uh, economic principles of open trade may be electing a president from the South. <laughs> and finally, you, know, you need a vehicle. And I don't know what that is, right? but this can't be done in the abstract. Um, you know, it could be something small, uh, a, a, a new modest agreement, maybe with South Asia, with North Africa, South American countries, or it could be something a little bigger, like waking up the TPP. Thank you very much.